Indian scam call centers steal millions of dollars from unsuspecting people all over the world every year, and they have a ton of different ways of earning your trust. Sometimes they pretend they're the IRS, threatening you with literal jail time if you don't send money immediately. Other times they'll pretend to be someone trying to give you money. These companies are well known by the Indian government, as well as police forces and governments around the globe, yet they continue to steal somewhere around $70,000 every day from unsuspecting victims. I decided I'd dive in and find out more. If you're one of the 60 million people who've been scammed out of money within the last year, the odds are decent your scammer originated in India, and in particular the city of Kolkata. That's because there are several companies based there that have quickly become the leaders in this $20 billion industry. And while you might be familiar with some of the scams, oh, I'm looking at you Nigerian prince trying to give us money, you might not know about the huge operations happening in Indian call centers. They utilize a combo of phone contact with online deception to bilk innocent people out of their cash, their savings, and TBH, their faith in humanity. And worst of all, these call centers focus on people over 65 because they know that crowd is less internet savvy and more prone to fall for people calling them about official issues. But to be clear, the scammers are more than happy to steal money from people of any age. So don't think you're in the clear if you're not entering retirement age, my people. So let's get into how the scams work. There are a few flavors of Indian call center scams, but they all rely on pretending to be a legit company or someone from the government. In a nutshell, they gain the mark's trust over the phone and end up convincing them to provide info like their bank account number or their social security number. One of the most popular scams that Indian call centers use is to pretend to be the IRS or whatever entity handles taxation in countries outside the US. In this case, the scammers tend to go the straight-ahead route of calling people directly. That's likely due to the supposed severity of the problem that they're pretending to be calling about. The scammer will say they're with the IRS and inform the person they owe back taxes. They not only inform the person of their debt, they threaten to arrest them if they don't pay and pay now. So the people being targeted will often start sweating buckets and give whatever info the scammer is asking for. The scammers even claim to physically be holding a warrant for the person's arrest in their hands. They say they can go to court or pay a fine of $75,000 or do an out-of-court settlement right then. Not surprisingly, most people opt for the third one. And what's wild is that sometimes people are so flustered, they don't even think it's weird when the scammers tell them they can pay by sending prepaid debit cards and gift cards. So before you go ahead and choose that third option, remember the following advice, direct from the IRS. The IRS doesn't ever ask to be paid via gift cards and prepaid debit cards. They don't even ask for wire transfers, another common request from the scammers. Frankly, if you're going to hear from the IRS, it's going to be through the Postal Service. They also don't threaten to bring in the authorities to have you arrested after calling you, mainly because there's always some sort of appeals process you can choose to make sure you actually do owe them. The Indian call center scammers do a similar grift with social security numbers where they claim to be from the government and they tell the victim their SSN was used used in a crime. Like the IRS scam, they convince the person they're facing arrest and they have the option of paying an immediate fine to avoid trouble. Again, they often ask to be paid in untraceable and non-reversible payment styles like gift cards. Although you know what's not a scam? Subscribing to our channel. Just saying. Another method involves actually getting people to dive into their own bank account online. There's one variation where victims receive a call, but it's way more positive sounding than the IRS or the social security number calls. The scammers make it seem like the person is eligible for a loan, aka, hey, we want to give you some money, let's party. Then the grift goes one of two ways. Sometimes they insist the victim prove they'll be able to pay the loan back by sending a little money up front. In that case, it's similar to the other scams. But other times, they're a little trickier. They'll make it appear as if they've literally put money into the victim's bank account, then ask them to send some of that amount back via gift cards, etc. But in reality, no money has actually been put into their account. So any money they withdraw and send is just their own money. Other scams are more subtle and more vicious. Sometimes they'll send a victim an email pretending to be a major retailer like Amazon. The email will be confirming a purchase 
purchase, one that the person obviously didn't make. But don't worry, little scam victim, all is not lost. There's a number you can call to dispute the charge. Yeah, so you probably see where this is going. The number is fake and it just goes to the call center. So already the person has an extra layer of trust because after all, they're the ones who called, not the scammer. So the scammer builds even more trust by going along with the person's insistence that they didn't buy anything. We'll get you a refund, no problem, they'll tell the victim. They'll send the person to some website where the person will enter their own bank account info as well as the amount they're going to be refunded. But then after they hit the submit button, the scammer will add a few zeros to the amount. Like in this video, showing a scammer in the middle of stealing $20,000 from a nice old lady named Bessie. She enters 200 bucks, but then that number is suddenly 20,000, and the scammer shows her a faked page that looks exactly like her real online bank. So now Bessie is guilted into going to her real bank, withdrawing the extra money, and sending it to the scammer, and she's really just withdrawing her own money. Scammers have a variety of personas they use depending on the type of scam they're running. Sometimes they're super imposing and mean like the IRS scam. Other times, like with that lady Bessie, they act meek and friendly. They play on the kindness of their victims by pretending to be their friends or pretending that if the victim doesn't send money, the scammer's family will suffer. But in reality, these calls are coming from giant rooms full of computers and phones staffed by cold-hearted experts who have been trained how to manipulate and steal. There are a number of people and groups who've made it their mission to prank, disrupt, and generally mess with these scammers. People like Mark Rober have been able to infiltrate the call centers and do things like release cockroaches, stink bombs, and more. Not exactly stuff that'll bring the call centers down, but he's managed to shut a few down for a few days, which ultimately means a couple million dollars of lost revenue for them. Then there are the guys at Trilogy Media who were able to get access to a scammer's phones and computers and basically catch them in the act. But these guys are mostly doing it to cause a little mayhem in the lives of the scammers and to raise awareness of them by having their content go viral, all of which is admirable, and hopefully it raises awareness. But you might be wondering why these call centers are still around if the US and Indian governments know they're stealing thousands of dollars each day. The truth is, there's not much the US government can do beyond trying to secure indictments of some of the known players in the scams and hope the Indian government will assist in turning them over. And in India, it seems like the local and regional police just kind of don't want to be bothered. And that's despite the fact that like 99% of the Indian people also hate these scammers and lose millions of dollars to them every year. The Federal Trade Commission put out guidelines to help everyone recognize the signs. One of the major signs is they often pretend to be a well-known organization like the IRS or Amazon and usually pretend there's either a prize or a problem, aka you're in trouble and you'll be in more trouble if you don't pay. Or you have money coming your way but need to pay a little up front to get it. Another sign is urgency. Since the scammers rely on the intensity of an act now situation, they'll usually insist if you don't take care of the issue immediately, it's going to be a huge headache for you. And the other major sign is instructing you to pay in, well, a kind of weird way. Like, wouldn't you expect the IRS to ask for a check or credit card payment? All things equal, it's kind of weird the government would ask you to send them a gift card to Target like they were your nephew about to start fourth grade. But they say sunshine is the best disinfectant, and when it comes to Indian scam call centers, that sunshine is spreading the word about them to anyone you know. And being on the lookout for signs of a scam. It's also a good idea to filter out unwanted texts and block calls from numbers you don't know. But even if you get on the phone with someone who might be a scammer, remember no government or corporate entity is just going to hit you up for money, ask for your personal info, and then ask you for prepaid gift cards. So don't take that bait. But the same is true with emails and texts from numbers and addresses you don't know. Never click on the links from those texts and emails. And don't even call the numbers that they list. Look up official numbers on your own and only visit websites you know are legit. Resist that little voice inside your head telling you to act quickly just because someone's asking you to. There's time to figure this out. Deep breaths, you guys. And obviously never just send money in any form to anyone until you know exactly who it's going to and why. Sometimes the best thing to do is to reach out to a trusted family member or friend. We all sometimes resist this because, TBH, it's embarrassing to ask someone if you're really being hunted by the government, or if it's possible you want a sweepstakes but you don't want to take the money. But usually your friends and fam can help you talk it out, and you're more likely to realize when you're getting scammed. And finally, when you think you're being scammed, report it to the FTC. They're probably not going to go all SEAL Team 6 and bust down doors across the globe, but it can help them build a case for down the line.
Okay, I'm gonna go check on my grandma to make sure she didn't send my birthday check to an Indian scammer. If you have stories of call center scams, pop them in the comments.